recent starting our discussion on IP addressing and routing. Now, if you recall what we have discussed in our last few lectures, we had looked at the TCP IP protocol suite, we had looked at the basic functionalities of the IP, TCP and the UDP protocols. Specifically, we had mentioned that the IP protocol is responsible for the delivery of packets from a source to a destination through a number of intermediate nodes which are typically routers. So, we shall today look at some more details about how this addressing at the level of IP is achieved. So, IP subnetting and addressing is the topic of our discussion today. So, we start with something called IP subnetting. Well, we talked about IP addresses in our classes. We talked about the different address classes in IP A, B, C, which are usually used for point to point communication over IP. But we shall today first look at a concept which is known as subnetting and we shall see how this use of subnets or subnetting can, can allow us to have more efficient management of the available IP address space. Okay. So, IP subnet the basic concept is that well you are already familiar with the IP classes A, B and C network. So, a subnet you can very roughly define as a subset of one of the address classes either class A, class B or class C network. So, if you have a standard IP network and if you somehow make some subsets of the network for example, I split one larger network into four smaller subnetworks, then each of the subnetworks are called subnets. Okay. So, this is the basic concept of subnet. Now, conventionally when you use IP addresses without any subnets, then the addresses consist of two components as you know, the first component identifies the network and the second component identifies the host and this obviously represents a two level hierarchy. Okay. So, a two level hierarchical addressing model is used in the conventional IP addressing. Okay. But when you are talking about subnets, what we are actually doing is that we are introducing another level in the hierarchy. We have the network portion, we have the host portion as it is, but there, but there is a third portion which comes in, this is called the subnet portion. Now, the concept is that in conventional IP addresses, there are two portions, one portion identifies the network the other portion identifies the host. Now, in subnets the basic concept is that the number of bits which are available for addressing the host, this is further subdivided into two parts. Okay. So, one of these parts we call as the subnet portion and the remaining smaller part is now used to address the host. So, this three level of hierarchy net, subnet and host, this is characteristic of the IP subnetting process and we shall see that using subnets we can have more efficient utilization of the address spaces. Now, in order to have IP subnets, we use something called address masks. This address masks is basically a bit pattern, a pattern of zeros and ones which will tell us that in an IP address, which portion of the address actually represents the network and which portion of the address actually represents the host. Now, there are two kinds of network mask you can have, we shall see these. One is the natural or the default network masks, which are representative of the conventional class ABC networks, but the other one is this is this can be defined as per the user requirements this is custom or subnet network masks. These two kinds of masks we can define and we shall now see what these two kinds of masks are really. Well, first talking about the natural mask. 
let us take a specific example. Take a class A network say 10.0.0.0, this is the address of a class A network. For this class A network, we define a mask as 255.0.0.0. Now, this mask if you represent in binary, it represents a bit pattern like this. This 255 means a sequence of 8 ones followed by 24 zeros. Now, in a mask which is actually a bit pattern, the pattern of the mask is like this that at the beginning you will have a sequence of ones, at the end you will have a sequence of zeros. So, the zeros and ones cannot be interspersed arbitrarily. The bit pattern will start with a sequence of ones, it will end with a sequence of zeros. Now, at the beginning the block of ones will indicate that how many bits of the address actually represents the network number or the network. So, in this mask the first 8 bits are 1, this represents that whenever we have an address like this, the first 8 bits of this represents the network. This is the network portion and the remaining is the host portion. So, a class A network will have a mask of 255.0.0.0 because in a class A network the first 8 bits represent the network portion, well excluding that special bit at the beginning of course. So, this pattern is called the natural mask for class A. Okay. So, let us take an example, suppose we have an IP address of a host as 10.0.0.20, this represents a class A addressing scheme. Now, now, with respect to class A addressing you know this means that you have a network portion of 10 and the remaining 24 bits a host portion of 20. Now, in terms of the bit patterns, the IP address can be represented like this 10.0.0.20, but for class A I told you the mask will be 255.0.0.0, this represents 8 ones at the beginning followed by 24 zeros. Now, actually what will be done by the intermediate internet nodes or the routers is that this IP address and the mask will be bitwise ended together. So, if you do a bitwise end, since the last 24 bits of the mask are zeros, so the last 24 bits of the result will also be 0. It is only the first 8 bits which will come out and we will get a result as 10.0.0.0. This will be the result after ending and this will indicate the network number. So, given any IP address and the corresponding subnet mask, any intermediate node can find out the corresponding network address by doing a bitwise ending, because knowing the network address is important, because the, the IP layer software that is running on that node will be responsible for taking a decision where to forward that packet next in order to reach the destination. So, knowing the destination network number is important. Okay. So, continuing with natural masks, for class A, B, C as you know you have fixed division of the bit patterns representing the network and the host, these are called network masks and the network or the natural, the natural or the default masks for class A, B or C networks are like this. For class A network, the first 8 bits represent the network, for B the first 16 bits and for C the first 24 bits. So, if you look at a mask value like this, you will know that we are using the default class A, B or C addressing schemes without really having a subnet. A subnet means we are dividing a say for example, class A network into smaller subnetworks. But if we have a mask value which goes like this, we are not really trying to carry out that kind of a division. Okay? Fine. So, now let us see how we can use masks to create subnets. That is the more important or you can say more wide, widely used 
you can say application of masks creating subnets out of an IP address out of an IP address or uh, out of an IP network. So, the first thing is that as I said using masks is very flexible why because as per our requirements we can divide a larger network into smaller sub networks. Well, if we can divide a larger network into smaller sub networks we can possibly make much better utilization of the available addresses. For example, if our institution contains four departments each with certain requirements then we can get one address class and we can divide it up into four groups so as to cater to the four departments this is one possibility. Now, subnets the basic concept is that what we do here is that we extend the network portion of the address into the host portion. Well, what we mean by saying this is that for example, in a class A network the first 8 bits represent the network. So, what we can say that well not the first 8 bit let the first 12 bits represent the network and the rest represent the host. So, we are taking out 4 bits from the host area and we are appending it to the network part. So, the 8 bits of the natural mask of class A network gets 4 additional bits from the host portion we get a 12 bit network part out of the network part 8 bits will be the network and 4 bits will be the sub network. Okay. So, this is the this is the basic idea. Now, the advantage gained is obvious as I have just mentioned we can create a number of subnets which are smaller each can have a smaller number of networks and which can much better match our requirements our requirement may be like that only we want smaller sub networks. Okay. So, let us take an example here suppose we have a class A network 10.0.0.0 well for a class A network as we had seen the natural mask would have been 255.0.0.0 but here we are using a mask of 255.255.0.0 what does that mean we are this mask corresponds to 16 leading ones 16 leading one means in the class A network 10 0 0 0 the first 8 bits represent 10 fine, but the next 8 bits also we are borrowing from the host address space those next 8 bits will be representing the sub network or the subnet. So, if we take a specific IP address for example, 10.5.0.20 this address represents 3 different things depending on the mask the first byte will indicate the network portion the second byte will indicate the subnet portion and the last 16 bits will indicate the host portion. Now, the network mask can be used to identify this because just by looking at this address the first bit will tell you that this is a class A network. So, class A network means the first 8 bits will represent the network looking at the network mask you see that well you have another 8 bits in the network part. So, the next 8 bit will obviously, correspond to the sub network and the remaining part will be the host okay. fine. So, using the subnets what we have actually done that we had a very big class A network, but by borrowing those 8 bits in the second byte of the address we have effectively split the total class A network into 256 smaller sub networks. Depending on what bit combination we have in the second byte the corresponding sub network will be identified. The first byte will be identifying a class A network the next byte will be identifying one sub network inside that particular class A network and the remaining 16 bits will identify a host inside the selected sub network. Okay. This is how the hierarchical addressing will be carried out. So, initially we had a large class A network with of the order of 2 to the power 24 hosts 16 million address range was from 10 0 0 0 up to 10 to 55 0 0. Well, 
but now what we are having using this subnet mask of 255 out here we are only restricting ourselves to the last 16 bits. So, we are basically having the subnet addresses from 10 0 0 0 up to 10 to 55 0 0 these are the sub network addresses. Now, inside the sub networks the last 16 bits will indicate the host number. So, it will be 2 to the power 16 minus 2 or 65534. So, now we can have potentially 256 sub networks each having well approximately 65000 hosts instead of one single big network with 16 million hosts. Okay. So, this is the advantage we are gaining we can have much better management of a large network fine. Now, just to look at an example again that same example IP address 105020 and this is the mask 255255000. So, if you expand this 105020 in binary and write also the mask in binary. So, as I told you the first 8 bits will indicate the network, the next 8 bits will indicate the subnet and the last 16 bits will indicate the host. So, just by using the mask you can extract the corresponding bits and you can find out that which is a network portion and which is a subnet portion. The first few bits of the address will identify the address class accordingly it will give the network portion. Looking at the subnet mask looking at how many additional bits are one there you can also extract the subnet portion of the address and the remaining will be host. Okay. Just to give you an idea well whether you are using default mask or subnet mask whatever the way a router extracts the network address is the same. For example, if you take default mask say you are considering a class B IP address 144.16.72.57. This is a default mask. So, the for class B the default mask will be 255.255.0.0. So, to get the network address the router will be doing a simple bit by bit ending of your IP address with the default mask. So, we will be getting 144.16.0.0 as the network address and the router can consult its own table to find out where to forward the packet next to send the packet to this particular destination network. Now, if you are using subnets then you have another scenario suppose you have an address like this same address, but now the subnet address is something else subnet mask is 250 or 250 or 192 192.0. 192.0 means 192 in binary means 1 1 followed by all 0. So, the first 2 bits of the host you are borrowing. So, if you again do a bit by bit ending, so the first 2 bytes 144.16 will come in, but for the last one 192 and 72. So, here the bit patterns are shown. So, if you do a bit by bit ending only this particular bit will remain, the others will all become 0 this means 64. So, the network address will be 144.16.64.0. So, in this way the router can do a bit by bit ending of the IP address with the mask whatever is specified to find out the ultimate network or sub network address. Okay. So, just one thing uh, may be coming into mind is that well we are doing this ending fine, but who specifies the sub network? the IP address is coming to a router, but who tells the router that this is the particular sub subnet mask you have to use. Well, this point we shall be taking up later we will show or we will see with an example that in a router there is some information about the subnet masks to be used corresponding to the destination addresses of the packets which are coming. There are some rules which are set in the router using the rules you can automatically select the subnet mask to be used. Okay. Now, let us address another problem. Well, we can use subnets to divide a large network into smaller sub networks. Now, if we do that as you can understand that the management of the subnets will be done by the local network administrator, because to the external world there is still a single network subnetting in is done inside my organization in order to suit my need, but to the outside world our organization still represents a single network say 
class B or class C whatever. So, if you are using subnets it means you need a single entry in the external router tables. Well, external routers means the routers which are residing outside my organization through which the packets are coming to me. Okay. So, the other alternative that we can have is multiple address classes. Now, instead of subnets what you can have suppose you have four departments, uh, you can have four different class C addresses and give one to each of the departments. Now, there well of course, it can serve the purpose, but one problem is that now your organization is not is no longer identified by a single network there are four independent networks inside your organization. So, with respect to the external router, router will have to keep track of these four different networks. Okay. So, there will be some additional overheads in the routers with regards to multiple entries in the tables. This is something you have to remember, you can use multiple address classes but you are not doing justice to the external routers, you are asking them to work a little more to store more information in the tables and obviously, their operation will become slower. So, pictorially if you are using subnets, then the external router out here this is your organization, the circular block is your organization, there are three departments say. So, the external router will be forwarding all packets to your internal organizational router, it will be identified by a single network and your internal router will be doing subnetting, it will be forwarding the packets to one of the three departments say. But if you are using multiple address classes this means that inside your organization there will be three different routers corresponding to the three networks and from the outside world there will be three different links. Right? So, obviously, the overhead in this external router will be more because it has to keep or maintain more information about the addresses or the networks inside the organization. Okay. So, now let us uh, look at another scheme which has been proposed in order to increase or improve the usability of this concept of sub subnets. Well, subnets uses masks and once we apply a mask to a network, it gets divided into several subnetworks. Now, the classical mask is fixed for a particular network, well what I mean by this statement is that suppose I am using subnet, I can apply only one mask to a particular network. For example, I use a mask to divide a network into 256 subnetworks, but I do not have the flexibility of applying several different masks to the same network in order to further and further split the network into smaller pieces. Now, this new concept variable length subnet mask or VLSM addresses precisely this issue. This says that the same network can be configured with different masks unlike the conventional subnetting where only a single mask can be used in a network. By doing this you can have subnets of different sizes, this is again unlike the classical subnetting where all the subnets are of the same size, but here we can have one subnet of size 128, another of size 64, another of size 32 and so on. So, this obviously this will allow better utilization of the addresses, because again coming back to that example of your organization. So, all the departments in your organization may not be having a similar requirement, some may be requiring more addresses, some may be requiring less. So, you can use this concept of VLSM to partition the address in a much more flexible and better way. Okay, let us illustrate the concept of VLSM with the help of an example. Suppose, we have an organization and we have been assigned a class C address say 192 This is the class C address we have. 
Now, in a class C address, we can potentially have up to 254 hosts, but say in our organization there are three departments and the requirements corresponding to the three departments are as follows. We want to divide them into three subnets and the number of computers in these three departments are 110, 45 and 50. So, as this picture shows there are three departments D 1, D 2, D 3 with with, uh, with requirements which are varying. Now, let us explore that whether using simple subnetting can we provide a solution or if not what should be done. Okay. So, this is the problem we want to solve there are three departments with 110, with 45 and with 50 hosts in them fine. Now, let us first look at the conventional subnet option. Now, for class C address you know that the natural mask will be 250 or 255, 255, 0. Now, if we are trying to subnet a class C network, so those subnet masks will be of the form the first three will be 255, last byte will be something x. So, we are actually borrowing some bits from the host part that x will tell you how many bits you are borrowing. Okay. So, using some non-zero value of x with leading ones you can divide the network into subnets. Now, let us see that how the different values of x will affect the number of subnets and the sizes. Well, let us look at this table. The first column shows the value of x, the second column shows that number in binary this decimal this binary and the third column shows that how many subnets you are breaking into and the fourth column that how many hosts you can have in each subnet. So, if x is 120 which means only one leading bit is 1 this means that we are dividing the available 256 space bit space 256 space into two subnets 120 at each. So, number of subnet is 2 we have 120 each. If you use two leading ones which means 192 we have 4 subnets and 6 bits for the host we have 6 available bits this means 64. If we have 3 leading ones 224 which means uh, we have 8 subnets and we have 5 bits for the host means 32 and so on you can divide it into subnet in this way. But if you again think of our requirement which we had, we wanted to divide the network into 3 chunks 110, 45, 50. None of these values of x will be satisfying our requirements, because the first row will not serve because it is dividing into 2 subnets, but we need 3. The second row will not serve because it is dividing into more than 3 fine but the sizes of the networks are not sufficient to cater to all of them one of them requires 110 right. So, this conventional subnet will not work because conventional subnet whatever value of x you define that will fix the number of subnets you are having and the sizes of each subnet because sizes of each subnet are constrained to be the same. Okay. So, now let us see what can be done in this particular scenario. So, now we exercise the variable length subnet mask or VLSM option. VLSM option you can think of as some kind of hierarchical subnetting. Instead of doing a subnetting at one level, we are doing it in a hierarchical way. Let us see how we are doing it. At the beginning, we are dividing the class C networks into two parts 128 each. For that purpose, we use the subnet mask 255, 255, 255, 128. This 128 has a single leading one, it will be dividing the class C network 192, 203, 17, which we had into two subnetworks, this and this. The first subnetwork will be having the host addresses ranging from 0 to 127, and the next one from 120 to 255. This is what we do at the first level. 
So, effectively we had well we are ignoring that 2 let us call it 256, we had 256 addresses at the first level we divide them into 128 each. Now, the idea is that one of these 128s is sufficient to cater to our requirement for the first department which was 110. So, now what we are trying to do we will further divide the second 128 into 64 and 64. Now, if we are able to do this then we can cater to the need of the other two departments as well 45 and 50. This is the basic concept we are trying to follow. So, this is the first level of subnetting we have done to divide into 120 and 128. At the next level the second network we again subdivide. Now, the second network will be having an address dot 128 because all addresses will be having that bit 1. Now, we use another subnet mask dot 192 where the next bit is also 1. So, now this second subnetwork of size 128 gets divided up into 64 and 64. The first of which will be having addresses from 120 to 191 and the last one 192 to 255. So, now let us see diagrammatically how this we have achieved. Now, this diagram shows the subnetting of the original class C address network. This was the class C network which we had originally. First we used a mask of this dot 128 to split it up into two networks of 128 each this had a size of 128, this also had a size of 128, these were the addresses, this is the IP address and this is the address range, this was the address out here. Now, the second subnet we again applied another mask this time with 192 in the last byte which will allow this network to be divided up into further two subnetworks like this which will be having a maximum capacity of 64 each. In fact, this kind of a partitioning is very well solving our, our problem which we had at hand to cater to the need of the three departments uh, whose sizes of the capacities were 110, 45 and 50. So, this VLSM is an option which is available to you, but before using VLSM you should be careful about one thing you should be sure about the fact that the routers which you are using they are compatible with the VLSM protocol. Now, VLSM is supported by most of the modern router protocols, but some of the older protocols do not support VLSM. Okay. So, this is something you must remember. Okay. Running out of IP addresses, now let us uh, talk about a very general and global problem. Talking in a very general way as I had mentioned that when the internet first evolved this IP addressing scheme was there, the address classes A, B, C were formulated. Now, at that time when an organization applied for an address class it was given immediately. So, if I need 1000 addresses I, I could apply for a class B network and get the entire class B network. Although the class B network had a capacity of 65000 possibly I am using only 1000 or 2000 of those. So, a very large chunk of the available addresses were wasted. So, what has happened in the process is that most of the IP addresses have become full or occupied. So, other than some of the class C addresses most of the class B and class A networks are now not available. So, now IP addresses is becoming a very important and rare commodity nowadays. Now, people are thinking more and more how to better utilize this IP addresses. So, that the way internet is expanding and exploding in size the pace can be maintained there should not be any constraint on that. So, so, as I had mentioned that the growing demand for IP addresses has put severe strain on the conventional model that is the classful model class A V C. 
huge wastage of address space due to unplanned growth. Subsequently, some measures were taken. The first measure of course, it is some kind of a geographical planning, creative allocation of IP addresses. So, now instead of directly allocating address classes to the customers. Now, what people are saying that well, it is better to allocate the address classes to the internet service providers. The internet service providers will be doing subnetting themselves and the customers will be getting one subnet possibly out of that ISPs in total address space. So, in that way the ISP can make much better utilization of the available address which they have. Moreover, geographically the addresses that are allocated in the different areas of the globe that can also be fixed and distributed. So, that by looking at the address you can have some rough idea that from where or which part of the globe the address is coming. Okay. But this has obvious limitations because, because for most of it the growth of the internet was not planned. So, one possible alternative which we would be looking at now is something called classless interdomain routing CIDR. Well, here we are using IP address again, but we are not using the concept of IP address classes A, B, C anymore. We are forgetting the concept of classes. Okay. We will see this and we shall, we shall see two other things later. One is that, well, we will just I have just mentioned in our last lecture that we have several private IP address classes like the class A network starting with 10 dot that represents a private class A network. So, what this says that you use internally private IP addresses and use a device called a network address translator or a network address translation mechanism at the gateway of your network. So, we will see later that how this scheme works and how this means this can solve the you can say requirement of of say large number of addresses for an organization. Say even if the organization has say for example, 2000 users you can do with two or three addresses only. Internally you can use private addresses there will be a network address translator which will doing some kind of translation automatically and dynamically. And the other alternative this also we will discuss is IP version 6. Well, currently we have the IP version 4 which is dealing with 32 bit IP addresses, but subsequently in the new proposal the version 6 the number of bits and the in the IP address has been extended to 128 and 128 is a pretty large number. So, that is another alternative. Uh, first let us look at the basic concept behind classless internet routing protocol CIDR classless internet domain routing. Now, CIDR basically addresses the problem that we have mentioned this is a related problem that the size of the global routing tables have grown very fast and the external or the backbone routers the size of the tables have become very large and they have tended to become saturated and have become slow. CIDR is a new concept which have evolved and most of the new routers and protocols today it supports CIDR. This is a concept to manage IP network. So, essentially the concept of class ABC network is now gone we are not explicitly categorizing the network classes and this also reduces the sizes of the tables in the routers. Now, what is the basic idea? Now, uh, in the so called classful model the IP address was preceded by some special bits and those special few bits identified the address class. And once you have the address class the division of your network and the host part was predefined, but in the classless model the concept is this. Well, you have no such special bits at the beginning of the address. You have a full 32 bit address, but in addition to that 32 bit you have another number and that number will tell you that how many bits of that 32 bit address 
is your network address. So, now you can have potentially a 17 bit network address or 25 bits network address any arbitrary value. It is not only constrained to 8, 16 or 24 as in case of class A, B, C. So, by that second number you can specify exactly how many bits you require. So, IP address is represented by a prefix which is the IP address in this example this is the prefix followed by a slash and then a number m. In this example, this 18 is the number m. This m indicates the number of leftmost contiguous bits to be used for the network mask. Essentially, this number identifies this mask. This number of 18 means there will be 18 ones at the beginning followed by 14 zeros. This will be the nature of your mask. Okay. So, now instead of explicitly storing the mask, you store only that number 18 or whatever. Okay. This is the basic idea behind CIDR. Now, in CIDR there are some rules to be followed. The first is that since you are dividing the address into two parts by defining that number m. So, clearly the number of addresses in each block has to be a power of 2. because ultimately some fixed number of bits are available for the host. If k number of bits are available then 2 to the power k hosts will be there that will be a power of 2. Now, another thing the beginning address in each such block well in this case the subnets are called blocks that must be divisible by the number of addresses in the block. Well, what I mean to say is that suppose I have a block that contains 16 addresses which means that the last 4 bits in the address are for the host and the remaining 28 bits are the network. So, 16 addresses per block. So, each block will be having a starting address and an ending address. Now, this says if you have a block with 16 addresses then you cannot have the beginning address of the block as like this because this address is not fully divisible by 16 you have 36 at the last byte, but an address like this where you have 64 this is divisible by 16 this can be the starting address. So, if someone asks you that what that if is this is a possible starting address of a block with size 16 you can just check whether that address that starting address is divisible by 16 or not. If it is divisible you can say that well it is possible otherwise not. Okay. Just an example suppose an organization has been allotted a block like this. This is the address and 29 is the number of bits in the network. So, 144, 16, 192, 24 if you write down in binary it looks like this the last 3 bits are 0 because 29 bits are for the network 3 bits for the host and end address will be first bits will be the same the last bits will be all ones. So, there will be 8 addresses in the block and if you compute them to decimal they will start from a value like this it will go up to a value like this. So, 144 16 192 to 24 up to 144 16 192 to 31 this range you can have for this particular block. Now, as I said the recent trend most of the routers they support this CIDR and the recent trend is to use or to move on to CIDR addressing completely. Well, if you talk about compatibility some of the networks may be already class full. So, you cannot make all of them classless just overnight. So, the thing is that even the existing classful networks can be represented by CIDR notation. Class A network can be represented by an address like this some IP address slash 8 means first 8 bits are the network. Class B address slash 16 and class C address slash 24. Now, as I told you that the recent the, the, the recent routers they support CIDR. 
Now, in today's lecture, we have seen an idea that how this IP address subnetting can be used for better management of networks. And we have seen that, uh, that just extending the concept of subnetting, we can have VLSM and we can go one step further in having CIDR, which offers you complete flexibility. Now, in our next class, we shall be looking at some issues regarding IP routing. Now, the subnettings are fine, but how the subnets are used by the routers actually while routing the packets, what kind of information the routers maintain in the tables, these we shall be seeing in our next lecture. So, so we come to the end of this lecture, we now have a look at the solutions to the problems that were posed in our last class, solutions to quiz questions on lecture 5. Okay. The first question was, what does the port number in a TCP connection specify? Now, here we have mentioned that the port number in a TCP or for that matter even an UDP connection, any transport level protocol, they identify the two applications on the two end hosts who are communicating among themselves. Okay. So, this port number is a way of identifying the two communicating end parties it specifies the communicating processes on the two end systems. Why is it necessary to have both IP address and port number in a packet? Well, this question uh, I have addressed repeatedly that IP address identifies the host and port number identifies the application or the process running on that host. Okay. So, it is, it is again hierarchical addressing, first you have to identify the host computer, then you have to identify a process running on that host computer. Okay. Which of TCP, UDP and IP provides reliable communication? Well, here I told you IP is a datagram service, by its very definition it is unreliable and UDP and IP are not much different, UDP simply adds a few extra information to an IP packet and sends it. So, UDP is also unreliable, but TCP puts some extra effort with respect to putting those sequence number acknowledgements and window all these things in order to achieve reliability over an unreliable IP network. So, if a part of the message is lost, it explicitly requests for retransmission in that way it provides reliability. So, only TCP is reliable. Both UDP and IP transmit datagrams how they are different. Now, this I told you just now that UDP contains some extra fields in addition to IP, they are the port numbers of the source and the destination and an optional checksum value, these are the two things which are stored. What are well known port numbers? Well, I told you in a client server scenario when a client is connecting to a server, there are some well known or well defined programs which everyone uses and the port numbers for them are publicly known these are well, well known port numbers and usually the well known port numbers range from 1 up to 1023. What are ephemeral port numbers? Well, ephemeral port numbers are temporary port numbers which are used by clients. Now, a client when it requests a kind some kind of a service to the server the server after processing the request has to send back a response. So, the server must also know what is the port number of the client and that is certainly not a well known port number. So, the client has to put a temporary port number every time it sends out a request that is called ephemeral port numbers. They can range from 1024 up to maximum of 65535. With respect to transport level connection what are the 5 components in association, this we have mentioned we need to have the protocol, local IP address, local port number, remote IP address and remote port number, these are the 5 things. Why is the pseudo header used in calculating TCP checksum? Well, we had mentioned that while computing checksum in a TCP packet, in addition to the TCP headers, some of the headers are borrowed from IP. This is done primarily to prevent misdelivery from IP. Well, even if by mistake 
the IP layer sends the packet to a wrong host, there upon computing the checksum the error will be found out and the packet may be discarded. What are the different fields in the pseudo header? The pseudo header contains source IP address, destination IP address, which protocol you are using and the length of the segment. Okay. These are borrowed from the IP protocol. Okay. This is a question on TCP, they said there are 5000 bytes which are transferred over TCP, the first byte number is 2000, 20050. 20050. What are the sequence numbers for each segment, where the first two segments carry 1000 bytes each and the last two segments carry 1500 bytes each, but it is it's, it's, uh, it's easy to find out. For the first segment, the starting byte number is 20050 and the number of bytes is 1000. So, it will be starting with 20050 up to 21049 the second segment is also 1000 bytes in size. So, it will start with 21050 up to 22049, segment 3 is 1500 bytes, start with this, end with this 1500, fourth one is also 1500, start with this, end with this. So, just by looking at the size of the segments, you can compute the end addresses. What is the purpose of the push flag in the TCP header? Well, push flag is used to push TCP data, but this is con conventionally used to indicate end of the message, to indicate that there are no more segments following corresponding to a given message, this is the last segment of a message. What is the purpose of the act flag? This is an acknowledgement field, this is used to acknowledge, acknowledge the correct receipt of a segment by the receiver to the sender, this goes from the receiver back to the sender. So, the sender can know that whether the segment was sent and received correctly or not. Well, if you are developing a network application on a reliable LAN environment, which of TCP or UDP you do prefer? Well, if the network is reliable, then we do not need the additional features that TCP provides. We would possibly prefer UDP, because UDP has much less overhead both in terms of the header size and also in terms of the speed of delivery of the packets. So, possibly the, the packets would move much faster in UDP as compared to TCP. Okay, so, now let us look at uh, the questions from today's lecture, from lecture number 6. For the subnet mask this, how many hosts per subnet are possible? In classful addressing, if we use the subnet mask this, which address class does it correspond to? Well, just by looking at the subnet mask, you can find out. What is the subnet address if the destination IP address is this and the subnet mask is this? What is the natural mask for a class C network? Using simple subnets, is it possible to divide a network into unequal sized subnets? For an IP address this and a subnet mask this, what is the subnet address? How many hosts per subnet are possible? 7. Among multiple network classes and subnets, which alternative imposes more burden on the external router? This I have discussed. Using VLSM, give a scheme to split a class C address into 4 subnets, where the number of hosts required are like this 100, 55, 20 and 30. So, here you can follow this scheme, which uh, I have discussed in the class, one example I have worked out, you can follow a similar scheme. Now, the same question, if the number of hosts required are 100, 50, 50 and 20, can VLSM be used? Can the following be the beginning addresses in CIDR based addressing? There are four addresses which are given, we will have to tell whether they are valid starting addresses or not. For a CIDR address of the form something slash 20, what is the maximum number of hosts that, can, that are possible in the network? Which of the following can be the starting address of a CIDR block that contains 
512 addresses. Here again we have 4 IP addresses. Now, you will have to tell that which of these can be the starting addresses of the CIDR block. So, with this uh, we come to the end of today's presentation. Thank you. Today we shall start our discussion on internet routing protocol. Now here we shall be talking about some of the ways in which uh, the routing of the data packets actually take place in the internet scenario. Uh, you may recall that in the last few classes we have already discussed a few things related to IP addressing and some routing characteristics of this IP addresses. In particular we had talked about the IP address masks, we had talked about the classless internet domain routing and means we had also talked about the variable length subnet masks. Now, using these technologies we can make more efficient utilization of an available address block. Depending on the requirements of an organization we can suitably partition the addresses and make suitable subnets designed as per the needs. Now, today we shall primarily start our discussion on the actual routing protocols which people use in the internet scenario. Now, to start with we talk about some of the connection options. Now, broadly speaking when we talk about two computers on the internet trying to send and receive packets between themselves we can either have connection oriented approach or we can have connection less approach. Now, in the connection oriented approach this is essentially what we know as the virtual circuit mode of data transfer. Here basically the first step before any data transfer can take place is to have a connection established between the two parties and the establishment of the connection is the responsibility of the network layer. Okay? And once the connection has been established all the packets would be delivered along the path that has been established as part of the connection and they will all the packets will be following that same path. This is one characteristic of the connection oriented approach. Now, in OSPF there are a number of fields in the header, I am not going to details of this version of the OSPF, which type of OSPF packet you are sending, message length, source address, this is the area ID which is the autonomous system ID basically, checksum and some authentication related fields. 